Welcome back to Percona Live. Jeff Frick here with the Cube. As you know, we go out to the signals, we or we go out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. We're day two here at Percona Live, Santa Clara Convention Center, the heart of Silicon Valley. John had to step away, so I'll be going solo on this, and we're excited to uh, to invite to the Cube Lane Campbell, CEO and co-founder of Blackbird. Welcome to the Cube. Thank you very much. So Blackbird is a new name I saw in my notes. What was uh, what was it called before? Uh, well, we are a merger of two companies. Okay. Uh, Palomino DB has been a longtime sponsor and contributor at uh, Percona uh, for about seven years okay. and is focused on uh, MySQL database operations and consulting. DriveDev was an operations shop with a DevOps focus. Okay. And uh, we decided to merge together, take everything up the stack, build a company that could operate everything with a heavy database focus. Awesome. So when did you complete the merger? Um, probably 30 years from now, but uh, <laughs> technically uh, we did on January 1st. Okay, very good. Congratulations. Never, uh, never that fun to uh, to complete all the all the processes behind a merger. Absolutely. But good deal. So we caught you, I guess, in between two keynotes here mm -hmm. at the show. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you were covering earlier and what are you going to cover uh, in the not too distant future as soon as you get to your slides after we finish the interview. Absolutely. Uh, I'm doing a melange of Amazon Web Services talks this time. So I just finished scaling my SQL and Amazon Web Services where I talk about both options of Amazon's RDS and uh, EC2 opportunities. And the next session is a di deep dive into RDS, so the Relational Database Service. Okay, great. So we were just at, uh, at Amazon Amazon Summit last week in San mm -hmm. Francisco. We were at Amazon reInvent last year. We'll be at Amazon Summit New York City in a couple of months, I think July, and then of course back at reInvent in October. So clearly Amazon is changing the world. The cloud service has been completely uh, transformative and the enterprise disruptive. Everyone's mm -hmm. running to, to catch the uh, Andy Jassy and the team at the show just released just, you know, it's like an avalanche of feature improvements, feature improvements as the, the breadth of services gets wider, mm -hmm. the, the depth of the services gets deeper, uh, and then I think they announced their 43rd consecutive price decrease yes. uh, at the show. So this just relentless innovation, both in terms of the feature set as well as the as the uh, as the pricing pressure. Mm -hmm. So, how did you get involved on the, working on the Amazon side, and what are you seeing in the marketplace with some of your customers, and how is mm -hmm. it transforming? Absolutely, uh, we started with Amazon when clients were going to it, and uh, it was obviously something we need to support. Uh, particularly, we've always been a very bespoke uh, company. We do uh, make sure to support our customers, but like Amazon, we can't do everything. So, uh, Amazon will start with a core, and then they'll evolve based on cu customer need. They'll start to out new features, new functionality, and so we did the same thing. And as more customers used Amazon, we moved to Amazon. As more customers used RDS, we started using RDS. Um, and yeah, at this point, I would say about 75% of our customers are uh, in some sort of cloud, um, whether it is uh, Amazon, Google Compute, Rackspace Cloud, uh, and even some folks who are building their own private clouds as well. Uh, and I mean, realistically, the own, that's the way it's going to go. In a few years, everything, every piece of infrastructure will be abstracted. And uh, this is a really exciting time to be part of the move towards that. Uh, as we evolve our own maturity matrix for customers to show them where they stand on the DevOps maturity uh, matrix, uh, being in a virtualized environment where one can evolve uh, very agile configuration management and infrastructure as code is crucial. And so we, have, that's, we at this point, we're helping a lot of our customers get to that point. Uh, we're helping a lot of our customers not need operations staff and uh, managing everything ourselves, uh, which is much easier in a virtual cloud environment, and also letting people know when it's not the right choice for them. So, so on the Amazon side, right, they have the service. So your, your value add then is mm -hmm. helping customers is it a configuration piece? Is it mm -hmm. how they set it up? Is it what apps are they using? I mean, where where does your value add sit on top of the Amazon infrastructure that mm -hmm. they're purchasing directly from Amazon? So Amazon themselves are utility. That's all they want to be. Right. And they're not interested in running systems that sit on their environment. And so we will help customers from a strategic view deciding which uh, which which uh, 
virtualized environment, whether it's Amazon or something else, is the right choice. Uh, we will help them choose which of their uh, architectural components should use an Amazon service versus their own service that they would run anywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, once we do that, we help people migrate to Amazon and we can run it, uh, the whole thing. Okay, so you help them run it Absolutely. operationally. Yes. And then are you guys playing in OpenStack as well? Uh, we do have uh, a, f a few customers in OpenStack. It's growing, okay. uh, but it's a little earlier, but okay. yes, absolutely. So talk a little bit about when, when customers are talking about making the move to the cloud and mm -hmm. they want to use Amazon or they want to use a service like that. What are some of the strategic um, gates you walk them through in making a decision as to where, you know, what should be where, what workloads should be in a public cloud, what workloads should be mm -hmm maybe on their own or behind the firewall or you know where a hybrid is, is more appropriate. Absolutely, uh, and I will say that up until recently we have predominantly worked with startups who are about in their mid-level of maturity, so not as much uh, enterprise clients who might have a much more hybridized environment. Uh, realistically, a lot of the folks that uh, come in don't have large operations staff, uh, They don't, and the staff that they do have want to be working on features, right? what we call development velocity, and so uh, we look for customers who recognize that and uh, I mean, at this point, I don't think a virtualized environment uh, is optional anymore. And more often than not, unless they are an enterprise or unless they have a large commitment to an existing data center, uh, going with something like OpenStack doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, but that being said, we do make sure with anyone that we are bringing in that uh, we set everything up with a mitigated risk so that it is easy to get them out. Okay. Uh, even though we've never had an issue with any specific provider uh, for risk purposes, it makes a lot of sense to use multiple clouds mm -hmm. or to use an on-premise and other hybrid. So then, so if they're startups, are most of the applications that you're getting involved with, they're new applications that they're mm -hmm. building as part of their startup game or whatever, I wonder if you can give any examples. Uh, so we're very much in their retail vertical and the gaming vertical. Okay. Uh, we do have a few others in healthcare and um, you know, sometimes IT, sometimes infrastructure, uh, but predominantly uh, most of the verticals we work with are either retail or gaming. And in those environments, we will either be brought in for a system that has uh, grown past uh, often it's already either already in Amazon, but it was not architected for scale. Okay. And we will come in and help them get to that next level. Okay. Uh, more often than not, uh, we do have, of course, some greenfields. We're doing a large, uh, large infrastructure uh, change right now for a new acquisition for Shutterfly. Okay. Uh, and in that environment, uh, we're going right to RDS and using that. Okay. So one of the one of the potential knocks on a cloud environment or or, or infrastructure as a service is 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 there a point in time where the cost of rent suddenly becomes becomes more than it would be the cost to buy. Where mm -hmm. often for, for speed of implementation, getting started, clearly renting a service is, mm -hmm. is the easier, lower friction. Mm -hmm. um, do you find that with your customers or is Amazon able to can keep up in terms of mm -hmm. the pricing reductions where they can stay, where they tend to stay, right. you know, kind of Amazon pure as opposed to hitting mm -hmm. you know, kind of this breaking point where maybe we really should put in our own infrastructure and it's mm -hmm. getting prohibitively expensive to continue to kind of rent the service. Absolutely. Uh, in RDS, there was a, there was a point where uh, people were getting priced out of RDS, which is more expensive than the instances underneath. Uh, and at that point, we had a lot of customers coming to us asking to move. The new, uh, I think they dropped most of their prices in, in RDS by 40% last week. Uh, so uh, it's amazing, right? So it gets a lot better. Some of the larger systems can be uh, very significant, but at this point, you can get a managed database server that is fully redundant for about six thousand dollars a year. Uh, and it's pretty impressive. What we will find is we'll help customers manage cost. Uh, one of the things people forget is you have a whole new component of infrastructure management in uh, how do you, whether it's using reserved instances, spot instances, auto scaling up and auto scaling down, removing snapshots, there's so many opportunities to manage costs that people forget about. And we make sure that that happens as well so that uh, people don't get runaway, crowd, runaway uh, bills. So to really fine, really fine tune mm -hmm. their their, their instance at AWS are kind exactly. of cost optimized based on, because there's a lot of choices, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of variables in an Amazon, uh, in a lot of Amazon purchase. Yes, and there are absolutely tons of ways to save money. It's essentially just another facet of automation becomes the cost management part of it. And that's one of the most amazing things of Amazon is uh, particularly for a customer that can leverage elasticity, whether it's uh, you know, because of peak seasons, retail during Christmas, education during semesters. Uh, the, any customer that can rely on the dynamicity of an Amazon can scale up, can scale down, can shift out, and uh, really, 
pay when they need to pay and not pay when they don't. Okay. So you've been doing this for a while. Mm -hmm. So from kind of a, a longer term perspective, right, there's a lot of new entrants into, into the public cloud space. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you know, Google Compute and, you know, Cisco just announced a billion dollar initiative, I think, last week for their new public cloud. You've got HP Cloud, Azure, there's a lot of clouds out there. Mm -hmm. But clearly it, it, it appears that Amazon's got a giant lead. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Andy said it was their eighth year of the AWS Summit. Mm -hmm. um, what's your kind of perspective as a kind of a service provider looking at the market and trying to deliver value to your customers as to Amazon's position relative to everybody else kind of jumping in the game? Mm -hmm. So uh, at this point we predominantly re uh, work with either Amazon, Google Compute, or Rackspace, and that is where we focus. We don't do a significant amount of Windows, so we haven't really played too much with Azure. Uh, at this point we are predominantly working with what our customers already have. Uh, if it is completely greenfield, uh, which it's pretty rare they'll bring in a service provider that early, uh, we would tend to uh, focus on a combination of those two. Okay. Uh, and that, of course, will depend on the strategy and the goal. We don't want to overbuild something before they actually have the revenue and the business model supporting what they need. Uh, there's a lot of options out there. Like anything, it's a matter of managing risk. And as a, I'm, I am a CEO, but I was a database administrator uh, by trade, and managing risk is core. So I will not go to a new database release in its first year, and I will not go to a new cloud in probably its first three to four years, um, unless there's some extraordinarily compelling feature uh, that just makes you be willing to accept a huge amount of risk. Right. Okay, so let's shift gears a little bit and talk about, we're here at Percona Live, mm -hmm. um, show's growing. I think mm -hmm. somebody said it's the 10th year of the show. Mm -hmm. um, why, is this why is this an important event? What's the, what's the feeling you're getting here at the show mm -hmm. from the community? Uh, so I started coming to these back when it was an O'Reilly show, when it was the O'Reilly MySQL conference versus Percona, who took it over. Uh, open source is a huge deal, and it still is extraordinarily relevant. Uh, I believe very firmly that open source technology and the uh, access to code, the access to uh, tech and to software, uh, and the access to open source education is what's going to help us get into the next level of the technological workforce. Uh, at this point, I'm not sure, uh, you probably know the numbers since I know you do this more than me, um, but even in Silicon Valley, there are 300,000 uh, Latino families who don't have access to computers and internet. Uh, so any any, comp any organization like Percona Live and like MySQL that is based on open source needs to be supported um, because that is going to be what uh, helps a child in Kenya solve cancer, figure out cancer, and get us to the next level. So uh, that's why I come out here. Uh, we support closed source databases too, but wherever possible we're going to come support an open source product. So let's shift gears again because I mm -hmm. know you're passionate about diversity in tech and you, mm -hmm. you've talked about you know, some of the digital divide you know, with, with, with families and people having access to the, to the tools and then of course the education and, and, and the focus on STEM. We're big fans of women in tech and diversity in tech. Mm -hmm. um, all of us have, we don't have a lot of women hosts, but we, we all have a lot of daughters. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, we're pretty passionate about it and growing up here um, in the heart of the valley, it's clearly mm -hmm. girls need to learn how to code. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk about some of the things that you get involved with uh, to support that effort in terms of mm -hmm. diversity in tech? Absolutely. Um, one, one amazing incident actually is at Percona Live last year, they did not have a code of conduct. Uh, and we had a bit of an issue, and uh, some there was a, some some conversations had. And this year, Percona Live now has a code of conduct, uh, which helps women come out and feel like there's you know some, a clearly written statement that they will not be harassed, they will not be intimidated, that they are welcome, and uh, that is a huge step in and of itself. Uh, and so it was really an issue last year in the year 20, 2013. There always is. There <laughs> always is. Um, it's amazing when you actually start looking at um, women speaking out about harassment and. Um, you know, even abuse at uh, conferences, how it quickly devolves into them being attacked, stalked, um, harassed. It's uh, pretty radical. So I was very happy that Percona took that on and got that in place. I was on the content committee for this uh, conference, and I was in the beginning. There were only about five uh, five proposals out of 400 from women. And uh, they were really very nice about helping me extend it, get out there, and get more women presenting at the conference here, which is great. Good. Uh, I'm speaking at a Bright Role hosted Data Driven Women event in, a, in a, about a month. And uh, wherever I can, getting out there, I, I think Etsy just invited me to Code as Craft to talk about that at their meetups as well. Good. And Etsy's an amazing organization for bringing women into tech. Good. It seems to be. Uh, getting more exposure, so just a, a shout out for, we've got a great Women in Tech playlist of women in tech that have been on the cube. If you go to siliconangle.tv, look under playlist, Women in Tech, I think we just looked before mm -hmm. we came on air, we have 97 uh, women of all 
um, roles, responsibilities, seniority, size of companies mm -hmm. um, who've been on the Cube, and you'll be joining that list shortly. Excellent. Um, so we're big fans, and and it's it's it is amazing in, in 2014 that this is still an issue. But we do see more and more at these conferences that there's often, uh, you know, kind of a women in tech lunch track or a special networking event or or things to really encourage mm -hmm. uh, to women to be not only involved but really kind of take a leadership position. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw that back with at, at EMC World last year uh, with Cheryl Sandberg mm -hmm. uh, as well. So that's that's great. So what's kind of next? You've been doing this a long time. You've been involved mm -hmm. in this community a while. What's kind of the next big uh, hill to take in terms of the MySQL community? Well, right now for us it's DevOps, uh, and I don't know if you're familiar with it, but sure. the, you know this culture of bringing the development and operations teams together. Uh, as we have more infrastructure as code, as we get to a point where you cannot compete if you cannot continually push code out, push change out, uh, that's where we, we that's why we merged. And uh, with every customer we're working on, we're pushing development velocity, uh, getting them to have. You you know, the ability to push code out as fast and as rapidly as they want and as safely as they want. We just announced uh, today an open source uh, toolkit for continuous delivery for databases uh, that is starting with MySQL. And uh, we feel like that's going to be the next step. Big data, of course, is there. Uh, we are in the middle of uh, ramping up a Cassandra team, which is uh, a very good addition in the data ecosystem mm -hmm. to a relational system like, like MySQL. And the demand for it is insane. Uh, so we're very excited to have just brought on our second full-time experience, Cassandra DBA, and are building that out as well. So in the, in the clients, right, there's a lot of huge trends right now. There's mm -hmm. there's kind of mobile first, right? Everyone's racing to get the mobile first uh, as, as a driver. There's the DevOps culture and and, and uh, agile software development, you know, just get stuff out in this this continual pace of, mm -hmm. of improvements and bug fixes and rolling. And then, and then finally, um, uh, the, the data first, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of the newer trend. Within yes. your clients, of those three things, what's really the, the primary driver if you had to pick mm -hmm. one of the three? Um, I will answer that in a way that doesn't answer your question, but goes that's, that's further. Right. That, that happens often. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> right now, I believe it's DevOps. In a few years, uh, no one will know what that is anymore. It will be ubiquitous. Uh, it is an opportunity right now. Uh, and then it's going to be data. At this point, you know, we're in the cloud environment, and it is the next revolution, this virtualized environment. Um, infrastructure as a utility, um, just like the electrical and industrial revolutions, but data really is it, big data, and you know how to, how to get the data in. Right now we're in the basics. How do you get all of that data in there? How do you keep it available? How do you manage these huge farms of data? Um, but soon it will be about the machine learning and the continued uh, evolution of pulling insights from it, and that's what we're going to be seeing. Awesome. Well, Lane, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thank you for We've having me. We've uh, been here with Lane Campbell, the CEO and co-founder of Blackbird. We're at Percona Live uh, 2014, Santa Clara, California. You're watching theCUBE. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise, get the smartest people that we can find in the room, bring them on theCUBE, ask them the questions you'd like to ask them. So thanks for uh, staying with us. We'll be back after this short break with our next guest.